So Mark Crawshaw is the founder of Atlas, and he's been working with a number of our um, modern microservices, uh, I guess, uh, adoptees or adopters in Australia, um, looking at the, the problem of how do you get visibility into a complex microservices environment. And so Mark is going to uh, share with us his lessons in, in, in that area. Uh, thanks a lot, Mark. Hi, Sol. Thanks for the introduction. So hi, everyone. Uh, my name's uh, Mark, as Sol just mentioned. Uh, I'm the founder and general manager of Atlas.com. And if you're wondering, Atlas is an atlas for software. So we're all about trying to visualize uh, those that, that uh, some of those webs, like the one we just saw with, at Amazon, the big cobweb diagrams, and trying to get some sanity into it. Uh, and I'm very excited to talk about uh, uh, how, how we do that and some of the challenges our customers face uh, in trying to uh, explain their, their software networks. So what is the problem exactly we're trying to explain? How do, how do we visualize your digital ecosystem? How does DevOps contribute to it? We're gonna go through all of that here. Uh, the solution I'm gonna talk about here is both software indexing, there's two fields, and software mapping, which we've developed here locally. Uh, and they're both uh, ways of both finding information out about software, hopefully uh, qu quickly, uh, and, and then being able to understand that as well. That's the key thing. Uh, and it's easier to, sometimes to find stuff, but can we comprehend it when it gets to scale? Uh, and so it's really sitting at the intersection of a lot of things, uh, a bit of code, uh, documentation, uh, some whiteboards, Visio diagrams, and, and also how we perceive complex software diagrams as well. So uh, let's uh, jump into the slides and uh, and start off with uh, start off with uh, the two different things that we're we're talking about here. On the left, we have us, uh, the technologists, whether we're operators, engineers, architects, uh, you know, the, the people that's managing these complex networks. And on the right, we have the complex software itself. And so that complex software, we spend a hell of a lot of time, you know, talking about. Uh, you know, how to architect, how to build it, how to support it. That's something we ha certainly have a lot of focus on. But the, the thing on the, the left-hand side, the, how we think about software, how we work with really complex software networks, that's something we think there's quite a way to go as far as innovation. And so, uh, you know, that's, that's the thing that we focus on here at, at Atlas every day. And when it comes to thinking about this challenge of, uh, you know, uh, how do we understand software networks? It's some, some people have a really good knowledge of it, you know, enterprise architects and so on, you know, they, they really have a good picture. But as soon as you go outside of that into the development community and, and the non-technical people that have to understand what they're investing in, uh, that, that really starts watering down. Uh, and so really it's about trying to empower everyone, give everyone the same kind of uh, knowledge so that we can all contribute to, to the software network in business. And really what our customers are uh, at this point uh, really understand inherently is the capability of staff to understand software impacts their ability to improve that software. Now it sounds obvious, uh, but that, that's what uh, we, we uh, the vision that we have and that's what we uh, talk about every day. So, uh, Atlas is a software mapping uh, platform. And before we go in and talk about and look at how to build a software map, let's just look at the end result so we can sort of get a feel where, where we're going. And so, software is about allowing anyone to understand uh, really complex networks. Now, this is a software map, and it's a, a breakthrough visualization technique that uh, allows people to understand software. Now, software maps sits the intersection of people and, and software. The islands and represent the business structure, and the nodes and lines represent the software architecture. And so, it's all interactive. It's all in three D. We can hover over things and instantly see what's connected to what. And this particular map has a uh, hundred systems and five hundred integration. So it's actually on the smaller end for some of uh, our customers. This next one uh, is uh, a little bit more complicated again. Uh, this is 500 systems and uh, 2,500 integrations. And just like a geographic map, we can zoom out uh, to abstract it and then we can zoom in to see a lot more detail. So 
So now we're looking at the administration business unit, going up to marketing, around to inventory, uh, and we can quickly start to see a lot of detail on this map, uh, considering how many applications this organization's got. And then on the third map, this is a, a, a bigger again. Uh, we have 2,000 applications and 10,000 integrations, just showing the level we can scale to. Uh, this would represent, you know, groups of companies or governments. Uh, and, you know, you, you can see once you were able to visualise uh, the, the map on, in, on a single screen, just how challenging it is to, or why it's challenging to deliver cross-cutting change in this an organisation of this scale. So that's the end result. So now let's jump in and have a look at what the problems are we're trying to solve here. And we really can think about it in two different parts, the collection problem and, and a presentation problem. So how do we get this data that the map's been built from and then how do we present it in, in a way? And and it's really not, it's, it's not just a one-way stream, not just from collection to presentation. It's also uh, a feedback that we find our customers uh, have in that, the more people that consume software asset metadata, the more people that will care about whether it's up to date or not. And so the ability to improve the collection and the cycles is something uh, we, we're going to demo a bit today when we when we hook up into GitHub and show you how we can uh, leverage the DevOps uh, pipeline to, to drive software asset metadata as well. So zooming into collection, what's the current state? So we don't have any shortage of documentation, I'm sure you know, uh, you know, and there's also no shortage of audits. It's always someone uh, that's, that's an enterprise architecture or an external vendor coming in and auditing the systems. We have reams of documentation uh, and process, you know, drives a lot of this. But one of the big challenges is, is that where does it get to? How is it useful to us in the long run? So it's certainly, uh, we don't believe about the effort that goes into the software, but rather, uh, really starting to think and maybe getting a heads out of the sand about you know, where does it go uh, and how can we make it useful in the long term. And so our solution to that is software indexing. So this is the idea that uh, just like Google indexes the web, that Atlas indexes business software, uh, that there's lots of different places that, that that data sits and we need a high level store for it that references that other information. We're not trying to create another store that stores detailed information, but rather referencing all these other stores, whether they're operations or architecture or, or development. Uh, it's workflow agnostic, so we're not trying to create other new processes in it. We're just trying to collect the information. It's super accessible. We have a very simple data model. Uh, and it's also uh, interoperable. We have uh, it's accessible via APIs. And, and as we talk about in presentation, there's lots of different ways to present it out. So now let's jump into uh, the presentation side. So this is a, uh, an area where uh, we don't believe there's been a lot of advancement. <laughs> uh, you know, a lot of companies still use whiteboards as the primary way of uh, telling stories about complex software networks. Uh, Excel SharePoint lists uh, are very popular for storing lists of integrations, applications, CIDBs, obviously architecture tools uh, and so on. But what we find is that information in this uh, you know, world of uh, collecting software documentation is very hard to find because you have to look across so many systems. Some of these systems are really, really complicated. And so it's, it's hard to uh, decipher you know, how to use them, let alone to, to find out what you need. And, uh, and when we go to visualize them, we try and abstract the, the software and, and simplify it, uh, they often break at scale, get above 100 applications and it just turns into a big cobweb diagram that no one can understand, uh, let alone keep those things up to date once the, the diagrams have been created. And so the solution uh, in Atlas for the, this problem is twofold. It's software mapping, which is a field we've developed here, uh, which is all about giving a place to software. And we'll talk a lot more about that in a sec. And then it's about publishing. So we think of software, uh, uh, the, the ex exposing the software index to be done by publishing out many interfaces. And, uh, and that allows different audiences to understand software in the simplest way that we can uh, describe it for them. And uh, yeah, so that's that's really the, the second part of it. Uh, uh, software map provides a consistent place. The map styles, uh, which we'll, if we get time, we can talk about today, 
are about telling different stories. So just like a geographic map where you might have a weather overlay on top of that, or maybe property price increases suburb by suburb, uh, and we publish out interfaces. And, and the key thing to remember about all of this is that changing the index uh, automatically updates everything that's dependent on it, whether it's the, the map, the style, and then all the thing that's published out from the style of map or index. Uh, so with that, let's jump in and have a look at uh, actually building one of these up. And so today we're going to go through uh, uh, sourcing something from uh, GitHub and then bring it all out into a published uh, asset that we've uh, got out and, and sharing with the rest of our organization. But first, we'll start off with creating a software index, a map, a publication, then we'll come back and see how we can set this up um, and, and be real time. So uh, here we are at, uh, at a, a, just as you, if you signed up for a trial account on Atlas.com, what you would be seeing. This is the homepage for the API Days organization. And it's where everyone comes to uh, view software metadata. So while you might have uh, nine viewers coming in and uh, looking at this data, you might have one person that's an author that can come in and look inside Studio and actually build. So it's a very leveraged system. A few people are able to provide that software information for a lot of people. So now we're in Apple Studio, and we're going to go in and create a software index. So we click New. Uh, we'll just call that Primary uh, Index. And we'll select our sample data set and click Create. So this is a software index. It's a very simple data model. I won't go into too much detail today, except to say we'll be talking about applications and integrations largely here, rather than some other more abstract or lower level things that we can store in, a, in an index or a map. Uh, and uh, so that index is set up. We have all the data in there. Now we're gonna go and build a map. So we click on the, in the map area, click new, and create our primary map. It's perfectly fine for an organization just to have one map. Uh, but many different styles, many publications. We'll select the index, and then we'll ask it to auto build on the server and keep and stay up to date on our on the server side. So when we click create, that goes up to our, uh, one of our nodes and builds the map out using our physics uh, our machine learning algorithms that are able to draw maps that look you know reasonably uh, uh, easy to understand, uh, but also you know don't don't have much of a, a distance as far as the integrations that are traveling. If we click build, we can jump in and, and here's the map that's been generated. Uh, so this is our map builder. We can come in and lock this and manually design it if we want, or we can just leave it as is and as the index changes, then the map will keep updating on the server as changes occur. Uh, so that's what the map looks like. So let's jump out now and click to create uh, a couple of publications. So the first publication uh, and the most popular one is Meta Search, and uh, we'll link that up to the index and select that. And that's really the Google search, uh, a textual based way of finding software information. So we'll click to create that. And we'll create a second uh, publication called Meta Map and select the map that we just created and select Meta Map and click Create. And so done, we've we'll created those two publications. If we go home, we can now see the two publications shared out into our organization. So let's start with the simplest one, the most popular one first, Meta Search, so the Google search. Uh, so we can jump in here, we can type in integration 100, click and bang, there's the information about integration 100. Super easy. Uh, there's no need to have complicated interfaces to find who the SME is for uh, a particular integration and email them. It's a, it's a simple a simple problem, but we can also just go show all. Uh, we can have a look at all those integrations, browse through them, click on a particular one, search for a particular payload maybe, uh, and there's all the, the, uh, the links, the, the matches for payload. Super simple, super easy to find information. So let's click out of that and now look at uh, a map. So here's the software map from before. Uh, and uh, this interface, unlike the map builder, allows us to actually interact with it. So we can click on a particular application, just like Meta Search, and we can see the high level information about this application. Uh, we can click on uh, the integrations traveling between that application out to administration uh, and see all the integrations traveling. So software mapping is designed to make it as easy as possible to browse around and find software information, uh, even if you're maybe not quite sure what you're looking for when you start. Uh, so there we're looking at all the integrations between those systems, 
can zoom in uh, and, and we can just keep browsing around to find out what we're looking for. Super easy and hopefully understandable by anyone, even the CEO. Okay, so that's uh, us uh, building an index, software map, and then publishing a couple of uh, interfaces. Now let's how, look at how we keep that up to date. So some of our customers have a lot of applications and keeping uh, all of the applications interfaces uh, up to date is a, is a real challenge. And so what they do is they uh, involve their developers in the process of uh, documenting this information and updating the map. So now we're going to jump into building a, 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 a connector uh, in uh, a software map uh, in, in Atlas and hooking that up to a GitHub organization and then seeing information automatically flow from GitHub into, into Atlas. This is a new uh, functionality that we've recently released. So let's click new, we'll select GitHub. Uh, we're building new connectors all the time. Confluence is another option. Uh, we'll click next, uh, type in uh, GitHub connector. Reindex, click setup, and then click connect. That will redirect us off to Atlas Test. We'll give access to that our organization. And a couple of seconds, it will just finish off the connection between GitHub and, and Atlas. Uh, we'll click close, and there we go. We're all set up. So now if we make changes in a, in a particular file, so let's jump in and uh, add a new integration into this JSON format we've got here. I won't explain this in a lot of detail here, but uh, uh, we're basically going to add a new uh, application called Hyperlocal2. Oops. Uh, and then keep an inter integration in here. Let's call that 999. 999. Uh, we'll make this an FTP uh, category. And all looks good. And so before I click start, we're going to head back over here and open up a map so we can see this all happening in real time. Uh, and then hopefully if we click and commit this change, let's double check, it all looks good. Yep. Uh, so we've got a developer pushing that change up now. Uh, and then hopefully if all works to plan, we'll see that document coming through. There we go, one document queued. And that will process through to completion in a second. Let's keep an eye, eye on our map. We can see hyperlocal here. Hopefully, and it will pop up in a second. One completed. Just giving it a sec to update the map. And so what's happening in the background here is the map's been updated by one of our servers. And to do that, it has to load the whole map up again and then add that one and then run those force force algorithms, physics algorithms again, so that, that is able to pop up. And so Hyperlocal 2 uh, should be uh, sitting here somewhere. There it is. Uh, and that integrate one integration that we added uh, is, is added as well. So what we're trying to do here is allow a developer uh, to be able to contribute to the overall system architecture and and doing that uh, by uh, uh, just doing their normal workflow in GitHub, adding some documentation in, and then being able to see that really, very quickly uh, in a really quick uh, uh, loop and, and see how they're contributing to the overall uh, organization. So that's it from me. Uh, it was really great uh, to talk to you today and uh, open for any questions. Okay, thanks, Mark. What a great demo. Thanks, thanks, man. While we're waiting for some questions in the chat, um, let me ask you. So you mentioned how developers can contribute to the application landscape, I guess, and that's an interesting thing that I've seen with a lot of traditional um, enterprise architecture repositories is that it ends up becoming this silo that the enterprise architects use the repository, but nobody else really has access to it or can update it in a way, and it becomes a bit of a bottleneck. Is this the yeah. sort of problem that you're looking to attack here? 
Well, the, the main thing we're trying to get at is, is to improve the quality of software asset metadata. And so how do we do that? And so one of the solutions we think is to get as many people interested in consuming that information and, and then uh, as and also in authoring it as well. And so the idea behind software indexing is to think of it as a, a problem of gathering that, crawling that information and getting as many people, whether they're you know, operations, development um, or so on, to, to be involved in, in doing that. And that's where the map comes in. It's really critical because if you can't see how you're, you're, you're adding to the rest of the organization software map, it's, it's hard to sort of get the, uh, the will to do it if it's just ending up in an Excel sheet, you know. Uh, but we think this, this will certainly help drive that people to, you know, want, in a positive way, to want to jump in and, and update it. Yeah, I, I think what you said was really interesting in the sense that when people can see the data and use the data, they want to get involved in making sure it's current. And so, you know, pulling down those barriers to make to to uh, accurate data. Can you can you give us an insight into some of the techniques you use to go and discover these applications and integrations that are out there in the in the wild? If I go into a brownfields environment, it's a good question. A lot of uh, uh, it really depends on where you're at. So a lot of organisations they just want to dip their toe in and they want to. They've already got an Excel sheet somewhere, you know, which organization doesn't that has a list of the applications and integrations. And it's just a matter of importing via CSV and getting a map up as quickly as possible. So that's a great way, you know, because once you can see that map to to then go on and work out you know, how much investment you want to put into to wiring it up. Uh, and then, you know, as far as the other options, it's really, you know, up to up to that organization. Uh, so we've got built in connectors where we can read documents off Confluence or GitHub and we're building the middle building one for service now. But a lot of organizations will hook it into their existing CI tools, call our API uh, based on uh, doing a release because they think that's, you know, that's the best time to update the map. And so a release, you know, is tagged to go out to production, then it reads a metadata file in that repo and then, you know, in their own format and then calls our APIs and update updates it. So, you know, we help a lot with making this really simple in a configurable way with uh, CSV or, or with our connectors, but uh, really there's a huge number of options for how you, you can, you know, build code, update your CI to, to work with Atlas as well. Okay, great. And we've got a question from Isha. Um, other than visualization and mapping of my software architecture slash structure, what are the other benefits slash usage of Atlas? Well, one of the big things that I didn't get a chance to talk about is the styles. And so we think there's a big challenge with communicating about complex software networks. So my background's in in uh, running middleware competency centers. And uh, I always struggle to try and explain why it costs so much to upgrade web methods or fuse or something. And uh, without that picture of just how complicated the software network was, it was really challenging to get, uh, to get that funding. And so where styles come in is that you can uh, just make the map look any way you like. So you can uh, make some uh, some applications red, some green, some yellow to explain maybe risk. You can change the color of the integrations to show which different integration platform that those uh, or API platform those integrations are running on. So we talk about Atlas as a storytelling platform. It certainly didn't start like this when we, we started building it five years ago, but it's turned into this really interesting uh, uh, thing that, that can you know help uh, 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 you know, solve that communication problem and bring stakeholders on board with what, what we're trying to do in the platform space. Okay, great. Another question, how do you set routes, permissions and authorities in the map? So uh, what data you put on the uh, uh, in the index is up to you. So we define a really simple model for software and then you can add any field you like onto that. So a particular integration can, uh, for say web methods or Fuse or uh, so on, can have a, a, a particular combo uh, selection to, to specify the permissions or whatever you like, you can search by that or create styles based on that. So that's really you know up to, up to you. We just define name, ID and some basic uh, fields and then you can add anything you like to the index itself. Right. And so can you, I, I guess, 
if I'm interpreting the question That's correctly, right? can you create some level of security around, or permissions around what level of access or particular systems that people can, can see depending on their role in the organisation? At the moment, if you use, there's two basic uh, access uh, uh, points. There's view users that can come in and see and can't edit, and then there's author users. We don't split up view users at today. Uh, you can see everything. You can publish different maps. So one map can be filtered down to a subset, maybe one group in an, in an organisation and another map to another group. Uh, but we don't have permissions on that yet. Certainly open to uh, the feature request, though, if you, if, if you need it. Right. Okay. Um, I guess, do you, um, have you, you've used this tool in a number of uh, different organisations of different types, etc. Are there any, um, are there any high level um, uh, observations that you have, any insights that you get out of having applied this in a couple of different areas? I think the big breakthroughs are with trying to communicate with non-technical people. So, up to sort of GMs or uh, the executive in, uh, you know, that what I was talking about before about, uh, you know, so look, look, one of uh, uh, major customers, a uh, big break through the, through the, it was trying to just have project to explain how complicated some projects were. So they have 1500 applications and they have projects that are touching, you know, 30 or 40 of those systems. And it, the, the functionality might seem seem simple that it's delivering out to the business, but, but how many how much impact that has on the software because we've you know maybe build, building microservices for a long time and 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 there's just a lot of touch points so bringing uh, other non-technical people on board has probably been the biggest breakthrough our customers have seen so especially architects enterprise architects yeah yeah I think a lot of times you go into uh, an organization at the kind of C level or the manager level, and people are saying, well, why does it why does it take six months to do this? It seems simple. And yep. with this mechanism, you can say, well, here's why. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Not just it does take the longest. I think, you know, <laughs> yeah. the arguments yeah. are pretty strong. So, you know, we think if over time, and that's why that map, try, we try and say it's consistent as possible so that it doesn't move much, that non-technical people become familiar with it. They'll see that, that that's part of their business. That's, it's, you know, like it or, or hate it, it is is what our business looks like digitally uh, and, and we have to work with it. Uh, so it's uh, something that we don't have at the moment and, and we think, yeah, something that's really key and that's missing. Mm. I think it would be great to use as a tool to then figure out where to prune so how you can then go in and start to simplify and where are the, where do I get the biggest bang for the simplification? Yeah, and why, you know, after a project got cut early, does the, you know, a big project was done in one of the departments, why does it keep grabbing space, you know, and, and get bigger and bigger this region? Why doesn't it get shrunk? And that, you know, it might be the sign that we're cutting the projects and not consolidating the systems we said we were. Uh, and yeah. so there's impacts, you know, there's a land grab as well. Indeed, yes, I see that a lot. Okay, cool. Thanks, uh, Mark. Okay. I, think, Thanks um, I, I think you'll be around a little bit. So if people want to catch up with you and have a chat one on one, then uh, they'll Absolutely. Be just grab me. I'll be on the chat. Excellent. Thanks for joining us. Um, thanks, thanks everybody so. for listening. Thank you. All right. See ya.